Next up, I would like to invite Brian Michaels, local activist and attorney at law, to take the stage and tell us a little bit about his perspective on Measure 91 and all the changes we've seen since last year. Big round of applause for Brian Michaels. Say a few first things that uh, might be pertinent here. One is, uh, some of you may know me, and I'm actually blind in my left eye, so as I turn all the way here, it's because I can't see you unless I do. No other reason. Um, as I listen to uh, Jennifer Bills talk, and by the way, I thought she was extremely charming, humorous, conversational, and, and very, very professional, as I've always known her to be. Um, but I felt at that point that I'm going to change the tenor and content of what I'm going to talk to you about to discuss the other side of a Dewey and the other side of forfeiture. And to discuss um, just what a political controversy marijuana is in Oregon when it comes to the, the difference between the police and the government and the people. Um, for an example, the legislature passed the marijuana laws. They rewrote Measure 91 despite the fact that historically, Oregon's initiative process has always been a political sacred cow. You don't rewrite initiatives. This time they did for marijuana. Never happened before. You don't write legislation that says, hey, if you don't like what we wrote, you can opt out. That doesn't happen. We were the second state in the nation to have medical marijuana, and we still have a political backlash against marijuana. And a part of that political backlash is this increase in Dewey's. And I'll tell you, it's also an increase in this under 21 marijuana tickets. Because the two best political lobby things they use when they go to the legislature are the roads are unsafe and the kids are using pot. And so this is the political motivation for what the police, through the very charming and professional voice of Lieutenant Bills, has told you here today. And, and I'm going to get you out of all of that. And then we're going to talk about forfeiture, so that they don't take your money when they shouldn't be taking your money. Uh, instead of all the uh, ins and outs of how to do the medical marijuana regs. Um, now I'm doing this because, A, I sat through the trivia question, and it seems like a lot of you folks are pretty pretty familiar with these regs. But what, what I tell my clients is this, don't rely on me, and certainly don't rely on your friends. Rely on the rules and the laws themselves. Very easy to get. OLCC prints them, you can be on their service, you can get them, you can keep a book about them. And this is what I say. I have a book that I was gonna use tonight in talking to you. Uh, one of the things I have, they have this business model uh, through the OLCC, and they constantly update it and tell you everything you need to know. You should have three books, wherever you are, if you take this seriously. You should have 475B, which is the new statutes regarding marijuana, because they're not, they weren't published in time to be in the books. You have to get them off the website. Just type in ORS 47B, and you'll get the chapter. Some of them are on the table that I was sitting at, like a whole lot of other handouts. It's not in any law book. That should be one book you have. The other book you should have is whether you're medical or rec. If you're medical, you should have all the medical marijuana OHA regulations in a spiral book, clearly organized, clearly tabbed, so that you can get to your section. And your third book should be your section. And so you become familiar with your particular section in the context of the marijuana, medical marijuana rules and the same system for the OLCC rec rules. So as they change, you can change your book and know what these rules are. That is your best source to know what the rules are, what you're doing. And whether you, when they change these rules, the best way for you to know, thank you, whoever did that. Thank you. I hope I don't remind anybody of Donald Trump last night, but I do. I do drink a lot of water. Um, but that's the best way for you to know the regs reliably. Uh, when people come to me, they usually come to me because they're brand new to all this, and they want to know how to enter the business. Um, but I'm not going to do that tonight. That's about all I'm going to do tonight. What I'm going to do is tell you 
First, about doing marijuana. Now, as you know, as I just told you, there's a huge political backlash. The law enforcement is big among the lobbyists against marijuana, and one of their biggest lobbyist statistics is an increase in doing, marijuana doing. Marijuana doing, most of the time, is a falsehood. And this is why. As we all know, marijuana stays in your urine 30 days. Once they know you're in the marijuana field, and they stop you, you are going to be arrested for doing if you are stopped by one of these anti-marijuana cops. Not all cops are bad, most of them are fair. All of the ones that come through my office are not. But all of the cops out on the street who are stopping people, most of them are fair. This is the way it works. They don't take this stuff, and sometimes they do. I have a case where they taped it, and it's, you can't believe the guy got arrested. I mean, it, it's unbelievable. But in Oregon, we have something called diversion, which is to say, your first duty, you can divert and not get a conviction. That, that is a statistic. So a false arrest, which has no basis in reality, like the video I viewed with my client, is, if he goes diversion rather than trial, that's a statistic to bring to the lobby, to, to lobby with the legislature. Marijuana doing. Was he convicted of it? No, he went on diversion because he didn't want to take a chance at trial. They're very difficult cases for them to win if they go to trial. And what they do is this. They ask you to step out of the car and do field sobriety tests. Then you go through the field sobriety tests and they say you're under arrest for under the influence. And then they bring you down to the station and you blow. We've all heard about the breathalyzer. Right? Um, and you blow a zero zero, or maybe you had a beer and you drove a zero one. But you have to blow really low in order to do what's called a DRE. Now a DRE is a drug recognition exam done by a drug recognition expert. Nowhere in your life will you ever hear the word expert used in such a disastrously ridiculous fashion. <laughs> so then this cop takes you into a room, not recorded, no video, no audio, and does these tests and asks you these questions and the only proof that he has to show in order to justify your arrest for marijuana is at the end he has to predict what's in your urine. Well, your urine lasts for 30 days. So when Lieutenant Bills, and I'd say nothing about her personally, but a lot of police will say this, don't drive impaired. Most of, more than most of the people who get marijuana dues are not driving impaired. The tests around the world go, marijuana stays in your system four to eight hours. If it's in your blood, it can be affecting your brain. If it's not in your blood, it can't be affecting your brain. If it's in your urine, you've already eliminated it. it certainly can't be affecting your brain. But that's the law and that's what they, that's what they study. So, what I tell juries is this, look, we all know Christopher Columbus, right, right, right. Well, Christopher Columbus, you know, was an extraordinarily knowledgeable navigator and astronomer. And one of the other times he came to the New World, he landed on an island, and, and his, him and his crew were very shipwrecked. And the people who lived in that island didn't want anything to do with him. And he well, needed their help. And it turns out, and this is all pretty well documented, that in about two or three weeks, he knew that there was going to be a solar eclipse of the sun that was going to pass over this island. And he went down and, and he sent his troops there, and he convinced these people that he was, they convinced these people that he was a magical god who could block the sky, sun out of the sky. And then, lo and behold, he blotted the sun out of the sky when he said it would be, because he knew it was going to be a total eclipse. And all of a sudden, they worshipped him, and his crew got back in the water and sailed back to Europe. How does this apply? Well. The DRE is Christopher Columbus. Your marijuana in your urine is a solar eclipse. And you, the jury, are the people who lived on the island. He knew before he said word one to you that there was going to be an eclipse. He knew before he said word one to you that there was going to be marijuana in your urine. Had nothing to do with blotting the sun out of the sky or whether you were driving under the influence. Complete fabrication. Happens all the time. 
This is how you can stop it. Once they arrest you, and it's very difficult for if this cop wants to make up a statistic, very difficult to not get arrested. He or she is just head on on doing it. You got to tell you got to do it. And there you are, you blow. And he reads you, she reads you your rights. Among them are you lose your license for a year if you don't blow. This is true. Always blow. From that point forward, they either just begin doing a DRE, which involves do, taking your pulse, taking your blood pressure, asking you to lift your leg, asking you to put your eye back, asking you incriminating questions. You just say no. There is no requirement or consequence for you not taking a DRE. You don't lose your license. Nothing happens to you. They don't tell you this. Some of them tell you you continue to lose your license for a year, just like you did with if you refused to blow. So that's what you have to do, is have it in your mind that you are not going to do anything after you blow into the breathalyzer. Except, and here's the other trick, you got to take a little steps here. The DMV, which is on their own path, says, look, if you blow low and a cop tells you to pee, if you don't pee, you lose your license for a year. So the rhyme is, always pee, never do a DRE. If you can remember that, you will not lose your license. <laughs> All right. Now the other way to screw with you is forfeiture. And I do a lot of these forfeiture cases. Um, if they use, do the mail or FedEx or some other, and these parcels come in. And I did a case called Held Fee Hamlin. It was a concealed weapons case. I'm sorry, a concealed handgun permit case. And the Court of Appeals said, look, you're not allowed to go to OMMP to determine whether somebody is a, uh, is a registered patient or grower or whatever, on, other than to that person's benefit. Which is to say, the statute says it's private information. The only way law enforcement can access it is to prevent an unnecessary arrest, prevent an unnecessary search warrant. Somebody smells marijuana growing in the house, they go tick, 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 oh, he's got, a, he's got a card to grow, so we're not going to, okay? Only to the patient or grower or other cardholder's benefit, not to their detriment. And the case was about the fact that the sheriff wasn't going to give my guy his concealed handgun permit because he looked him up and said, well, you got a marijuana card. I'm not going to give you a permit, concealed handgun permit. The other, another of the many ways that uh, we are the unli unliked and disliked a stepchild in Oregon government is that the police refused to abide by that case. I was on the um, advisory committee for years, and I couldn't get them to agree to devise some method to prevent police from accessing people's private information unless for their benefit. I couldn't even get them to release the names of the police who are accessing it all these hundreds of times every month. Why, they would say, we have to protect the privacy of the police. See? <laughs> and you just couldn't get them to do it. So how is this relevant to forfeiture? When these packages come in, FedEx, and they pull them aside, they look up, ding, 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 ding. oh, he's a, he or she is a medical marijuana person. And now with OLCC, oh, he or she has an OLCC license. And that grounds to open the package. And I'll tell you, I do a lot of these cases, and there's two kinds of forfeiture cases. One is what I call currency only. The only thing they find in the package is money, or money with drugs. Now, money with drugs is not what I'm going to talk to you about. You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say a friend of yours is sending you money because of a car he bought and he drove to Oklahoma and now he's sending you back the money to pay for the car, or he loans you money for your business or something. Trust me, they'll deny it till the day is gone. These dogs smell currency. More than a third of the packages, by their own statistics, that are opened based on dogs are opened with currency only. These dogs smell money. And when they find out you've got a card, they're going to take your money. So I'm going to give you one really sweet little tip. Money orders don't smell. 
Got it? Money orders don't smell. Go to a bank, a goddamn money order, put it in an envelope and mail it. <sighs> Otherwise, people lose thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars this way. And that's my rap on forfeiture. What else do I have? Oh, by the way, uh, Ninth Circuit, which we, on federal law, we're speaking, we're in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, next to the Supreme Court, that's the highest court of the land in terms of being in federal court. About a month ago, give or take days, the, Supreme, the Ninth Circuit Court issued a ruling that's called McIntosh. And McIntosh was about uh, three different types of cases in California where three different groups of defendants were charged with marijuana production or marijuana um, distribution. And they all did the same defense. They said, wait a second, there's a rider on the bill that was just passed last June, which you may or may not have remembered. The Congress passed a rider to the, to the, uh, the spending bill that said no money shall be spent on the, by the federal government to prosecute marijuana that is lawful in the state that it's found. So in this case, if it's lawful in Oregon, they're not going to prosecute it. And they won. The Ninth Circuit said, that's right. As long as this rider exists, you cannot prosecute anybody who's legal in the state of Oregon. Up until now, we were not of any interest to the federal government because our numbers were so low and they think of themselves as so important. They really didn't care about us much, which is why you saw all these cases come out of California. Because California let you grow a lot of pot. Now we're growing a lot of pot, well, pretty soon. <laughs> a lot of pot. I mean, an acre's worth of pot's a lot of pot. <laughs> Unless they change that rider, you don't have to worry about federal, uh, federal law enforcement at all, including federal forfeiture, by the way. Because you'll still be spending money on prosecuting marijuana activity, though they're illegal in the state of Oregon. So, um, any questions? Any answers? Any toolies? Any winks? Yeah. So, um, my que question refers to money orders. Um, I recently, <laughs> I work for a company that does contract processing. I'm sorry. I, I work for a company that does contract processing and co-packing, and we did an anti-money laundering training. Um, and I'm not sure you, where you are. I'm, I'm right here. Oh, there you are. Thanks. <laughs> and I was just curious, you were talking about money orders and forfeitures. Um, aren't there stipulations that money order transactions over a certain amount you have to file a certain tax papers for if it's oh, like a loan or a payment or something like that? It's like uh, over $10,000. Yeah, $10,000. Any, any cash transaction more than $10,000, you have to file what's called a, a transaction report with the Department of Treasury. Um, and there's something called structuring, which is to say if you keep depositing $7,000 uh, $7, quantities of cash into your bank, They'll consider that structuring, and banks are required to be alerted to that sort of thing, so that instead of filing 11,000 or 14,000, you break it up into two, mm -hmm. and suddenly you have a 7,000 one day, a 7,000 Thursday, that's more money laundering. That's true. All that's true. Uh, how your person gets your money to you is that person's problem, because they're the ones that are buying your product, not illegal products. They're the people that are buying whatever it is you're selling them, a car, a loan. Uh, I've had many investments in business. Um, if it's legitimate, it's not yeah. such a big problem. Right. If it's not legitimate, it's their problem. <laughs> because they're going to lose their money. And then you get into a fight with whose money is it? You sent it. I didn't get it. You've got to send it again because the feds took it. And if you believe me that the dogs smell currency, um, it's a really risky thing to send marijuana money through the mails these days. Next question. Squeaky. Dave. 
It's been tell a long me, time. Can you tell me why, Brian? <laughs> can you tell, can you, let, let, let me, let me preempt you for a second. Yes, the laws in Oregon around marijuana are completely insane. And if you don't know it by now. <laughs> I suspected it. Yeah, I mean, it's the definition of insanity. If you can tell it, say it all, expect a different result. I mean. <laughs> I just wanted to ask about a technicality. Uh-huh. Because the banks uh, won't, well, no, give uh, the dispensaries an account, and they have to pay in cash. Why isn't the state guilty of money laundering? What's that? Because the, the. Right, right. I got that part. What was the end? Why isn't the state guilty of money laundering when they take cash? Well, they're for, only guilty for payments. of money. They're only guilty of money laundering if they're concealing an illegal transaction by using cash, which becomes much more easy to do if all you're doing is dealing in cash. But if it's a legitimate cash transaction and they file with the feds a, a, a transaction report, there's nothing money laundering about it because you're not concealing a transaction by using cash. I tell all my clients to have a CPA. It, it's, it's insane to try to navigate through these cash waters without the protection of a CPA that says, hey, I looked at all this. Their accounting of this money, I think, is, 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 is passable. They're not hiding any money. They're not, uh, they have a system that prevents them from using cash to conceal transactions, that kind of thing. You got to, you got to. Um, and, and how you get a bank account, of course, is one of those questions that's difficult to answer, although you didn't ask it. But um, if you name your company Green Buds from, for, for Love, you're probably not gonna get a bank account. So I, I usually tell my clients to use the names of the people that are on the, on the business. Either mix the letters up to make a new word, or just say Ben and Jerry, you know, it's very simple. And, and it's very innocuous, it's very, you can explain it when they ask you where to get the name of us. Because um, it's really not illegal for you to deposit <coughs> legal transactions into a bank account. And if you get a bank account, you don't have much cash anymore. You can get, you can use credit cards, you can take checks, and so your, your amount of cash transaction drops, you know, 90, 95% around there. So it eliminates so many of these problems, including the threat of getting robbed, because you got all this cash hanging around. Um, but how you get into a bank to get them to give you an account is a difficult, difficult thing. Question. I'm sorry. If a, if a dispensary takes a credit card, the purchaser who, right. gave, who used the credit card, the credit card can call their bank and cancel the, the, the purchase. Is that true? I just, well, I if I understand your question correctly, which what? by the look at your like face, I don't. Like, I guess sorry. Like That's okay, question. but you, you can, like do, but you like can do that business. with any transaction. I mean, uh, I, I had a rental car company overcharge me once and I stopped payment on my American Express card. I said, I didn't make that shit. Charge and then they investigate. And if I win, in that case I did, they, they, they don't charge it. So a dispensary wouldn't be exempt from a purchaser um, challenging the charge on their car. But because it's part of the marijuana industry, will um, once the bank investigates it, will they cancel it? Oh, heavens no. Have, okay. okay. Good. I'm sorry, I didn't Good. understand. No. Will they cancel oh, it? No. Is that I don't true? Care. No, no, okay. no, 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 no. That was my question. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I'll, I'll take hands. Uh, we have another question right here. 
Brian, Sean, nice being my Genesis man. Arms. How are you, buddy? How are you, Once boss? Once again, brother, thank you for your time. I'm glad I'm not Say paying again? for it this time. I said, thank you for your time. I'm glad I'm, sure. I'm not paying for it this yeah. time. <laughs> well, kind of. I did sponsor the event with my partner, but <laughs> still, I'm not getting a bill, right? Right? What's that? I'm not getting a bill here, right? Well, you are, but no one else is. <laughs> All right, I'll pay it. Anyway, my question to you is the, the same question I posed to EPD earlier. Of course, to you, I'm going to rephrase it a little differently. To you, I'm going to ask you, are you going to advise me to not offer free cannabis-infused products to the people that are over 21 in this room? It's a public place. You can't do anything under the, under the ma marijuana legalization laws in public. Now, who's going to arrest you? I have no idea. <laughs> you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Send me a bill. All right. <laughs> the other issue, as I understand it, is a venue that holds an OLC. Uh, OLCC license, liquor license, uh, could be in danger of losing that um, if cannabis products are distributed. So, again, please respect our awesome venue tonight. Question, Leanne? I saw another hand over here. All right, back to Kathy. Yeah, Brian, um, I was in the legislature when Bill Fry and Margie Hendrickson years ago uh, canned the uh, RICO legislation in Oregon. What's that? The RICO legislation, the racketeering. Oh, RICO, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, So uh, you said that the forfeiture has gone bye-bye, but I'm kind of curious. It used to be with RICO, if three or four people were colluding together to do some kind of illegal money scheme, they could go uh, into the federal courts. That's one question. The other thing is, what about the thousand feet from the school rule? Uh, are the police still enforcing that for growing or uh, dealing? Um, I, there are several questions. You asked me about RICO, and you said something about going to forest federal land. Well, the feds can prosecute you if you do anything on federal land because it's not legal within the state of Oregon. It's an exemption from the legalization of marijuana to grow marijuana on federal land, even though it's geographically located in Oregon. Um, in terms of RICO and money laundering, it requires what they call an enterprise. So like if Cosmic Pizza or World Pies decided that they were gonna deal drugs under the enterprise of World Pies, that would, be an, that would be an enterprise and satisfy the element for RICO, which requires, which, which allows for much greater penalties than simple conspiracy to sell marijuana. That's a really, really short script way to say what I wanted to say, but maybe you get the idea. We've got one more question over here. I'm sorry? It's good to see you, and I will see you after we get up there for a couple of I know, my term ran out, so I'm not up there any longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to tell you, what is the status of the people who, of course, have become homeless because they couldn't look for a job in the 80s without going to jail Lady with the power of nose said, no more medication. I do my recreation. But in the meanwhile, some of us just didn't look for work when we were paying taxes. And the consequences is that you're stuck with us with very ridiculous income, no real home. Half of the homeless population is there because of this, as is half of the educated public, and you know that. But the, the, my question is, now that we're all legal, where do the poor people get to use their medicine? We're not allowed to do it in the parks that I thought belonged to us. The apartments we rent, we're not allowed to do it in the car. Where the hell can we have our legal pot? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, there is no guarantee to work if you have a medical marijuana card in Oregon. Terrible like case called Emerald Steel several years ago. I've Any got else? I've got one for you. Sure. Um, going back to Dewey's. Uh -huh. So, is there any legitimate conversation right now about the anatomical differences between how a man and a woman's body stores THC? I I, I don't believe so. Uh, you know the whole body weight proportion to amount used. But you know the the rates of THC in any given use vary also. Yeah. Um, 
but the, 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 the biology of if it ain't in your blood, it ain't in your brain, you're not under the influence, is true for everyone. And like I say, the statistics about consumption and term in blood are from four to eight hours. And there's been studies in Australia, and uh, one study in America, and one in somewhere in Europe, I forget where, that uh, made those kind of studies to determine how long it stays in your system. Obviously, it's not as precise as many other studies on other issues um, in terms of it stays in here this long if you take that much. Um, but clearly, um, most people who use marijuana um, use it more than eight hours before they drive. Uh, and, and just to get into a little further, there's a metabolite that stays in your urine for about eight hours uh, above the threshold of the lab test, and then quickly drops between the threshold, which means it's still in there, but at a, at a level that the lab test don't catch. And if you have that metabolite in your urine, you've been driving within the last eight hours. The good news is if you don't, you have it. But there's all kinds of issues around all of this. The best thing to do is always pee. <laughs> Never do a DRE. <laughs> Uh, and you won't, you, I've had this one case that I just talked about where they're thinking of prosecuting this guy even though he refused to deal with DRE. And the field sobriety tests are some of the best I've ever seen in terms of someone not under the influence. So there's always some insanity there out there that you're just, you're just bringing your head against the wall. But by and large, every person who's declined to do a DRE has not been prosecuted. That's a golden nugget for this evening. Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, everybody. We appreciate so much what you've done this for this community. And personally, I appreciate your representation of me in defending my rights, and Brian will do the same for you guys. So it's just amazing how strong this community is. So if you'll sit tight, I just have a few closing remarks to make. Of course, we did go a little over tonight, and I really appreciate you guys staying so engaged with all of your questions. We just had so many amazing experts we wanted to share with you tonight. But again, it's, uh, it's our sponsors that keep this event going. And I'm just so grateful to Sean at Genesis Farms, and Adrian and the whole team down at Farm Fresh. This is what makes this all possible for us, you guys. So don't forget to fill out a survey form before you go. We really want to hear who your favorite speaker was, what you'd like to see next January. Keep the feedback coming. And please join us next month, uh, where Oregon's Constant Gardener and OG Analytical will present cooking and concentrating with cannabis. And we're going to try to do some hands-on demos on stage. We'll see what they'll let us do. So come back next month, y'all, and thank you so much for making this what it is.